You know, as I was cleaning my fridge and kitchen cabinets, I was going through all of my products and I noticed something in a lot of the ingredient lists that I somehow had glossed over all of these years. And once I noticed it, I thought it might be interesting to check the supplies in my bathroom cabinet to see if they also had the same pattern. And here's what I found. Soy is in everything from cereals to canned tuna to shampoo. Even in products that don't show soy in its ingredients label, you'll find it under aliases such as textured vegetable protein or lecithin. In fact, soybeans are added to around 60% of the nation's processed foods. And they have some real health benefits like high protein and amino acids. But soy is also one of the most common food allergies, especially among children and infants. And high doses of it have been linked to an increase in estrogen responsive cancers. So if consuming this small legume poses potential health risks, why is it still in seemingly everything? Well, like anything, money has a lot to do with it. In the 2020 season, Brazil is expected to overtake the U.S. and become the world's leading soybean producer. The U.S. had held that title for several decades, and for several centuries prior to that, East Asia dominated the soy production sector. The earliest records of commercial soybean production in China from 1909 to 1913 indicated that the country produced an estimated 71.5% of the world's soybeans. In the following two decades, shipments of soybeans and oil to Europe skyrocketed. The soybean imports were mainly used in mixed livestock feeds, and the overall success of the soybean market caught America's attention, and starting in the early 1930s, the country gradually became a major competitor in the market, overtaking countries like Japan and Korea. World War II disrupted the international soybean trade between Europe and China, reducing it to nearly nothing by 1941. Meanwhile, the United States soybean market was flourishing. The country was in need of domestic sources of fats, oils, and meal, and it looked to soybeans as the answer. So the USDA distributed a pamphlet in early 1942. It urged farmers to increase soybean acreage and offered support programs to help farmers meet their quotas. So America doubled its soybean production and soon became the world's leading soybean producing country. Little did the country know that it would hold that title for decades to come. In 2018, the U.S. produced 89.6 million acres of soybeans, making it the country's biggest crop planted by land usage. That's bigger than the total area of New Mexico. In 1961, the world produced 1 billion bushels of soybeans, and it only took 12 years for production levels to pass 2 billion bushels, and 6 years after that, to pass 3 billion. Jump forward to 2019, and over 12 billion bushels were produced worldwide. And if you read any ingredient list, you'll see why we're producing so much. So it's kind of everywhere because it has what they call functional properties. It can hold moisture, it can emulsify. Um, and then also it has expense properties of extending something in a less expensive manner. It also is a remarkable plant that has all these different components and properties. Uh, it's got lecithin, oil, and protein, wow. And it's got all these chemical um, properties. It, it emulsifies, it improves wettability. It holds moisture into certain foods. It just has remarkable chemical properties. It's just the most amazing plant. These properties make soy very appealing to food manufacturers. Many ingredients in common food products naturally separate over time, creating uneven layers of liquid and clumping. So soy binds these ingredients together, particularly oil-based foods like mayonnaise, salad dressings, and even chocolate. It's also used as an antioxidant and helps lock in the flavor in foods. Soy has also played a large role in the dairy alternative market due to its high levels of protein, fats, and amino acids. But perhaps the most appealing part of soy is its price. Soy oil is cheaper, for example, than olive oil or canola oil. So you might use soy oil in your uh, commercial baked good because it's just cheaper. Part of the reason it's so cheap is because we are already growing so much of it, but not for us. Only 15% of the soybeans produced in the country go towards human consumption. Instead, over 70% of the soybeans produced go into making animal feed. But chickens and pigs eat a lot, a lot of soybeans to get what you need 
the protein you need out of a chicken or a pig, you're gonna have to raise that critter and, and even to get eggs. That animal is going to need food and it's gonna expend food in its own metabolism. Soy has been found to be a wonderful addition to poultry and swine diets. And because so much soy is harvested for these animals, it's much cheaper to produce. So economically, it's cheaper. And the reason it's cheaper is because we're growing so much of it for uh, chickens and pigs already that we've got a lot of it. The United States is the top producer of soy, and it's one of our top exported agricultural exports. It's our top earning plant export. So because of that farm dynamic, we've got a lot of it. That makes it cheap. And because it's cheap, it's good for manufacturers to use in food products. But it's more than these properties that make soy so commonplace. It's also a story about the power of marketing and lobbying. As the soy industry continued to grow during the mid to late 1900s, evidence began to surface that soybean oil consumption increased consumers' vulnerability to infectious diseases and cancers. So in response, soybean manufacturers began a multi-million dollar PR campaign. The Whole Soy Story by Dr. Kayla T. Daniel revealed that starting in the mid-1980s, soybean manufacturers spent millions in marketing campaigns that pinned saturated fats as the real culprit. They stated that saturated fats raised cholesterol, therefore increasing the risk of heart disease. Whether or not saturated fats increase the risk of heart disease remains controversial to this day. But food manufacturers across the country listened and removed products that contain saturated fats like coconut and palm oils from their shelves. This gave rise to the soybean market. Soybean oils in the form of hydrogenated vegetable oils found their way into 40% of all foods in supermarkets. Still, industry leaders and scientists are torn on just how healthy or unhealthy soy really is. Another con of the exponential rise of soybean production is its effect on the environment. The rapid expansion of soybean plantations has led to high levels of deforestation, particularly in central Brazil. In South America, there was a great mushrooming of growth of soy uh, in Brazil and then Argentina and then Paraguay. In, it started in the 60s, it was very small, and then it grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. First, the Cejado, which was also a great savanna, was largely taken over with soy plantations in Brazil. And then more and more, there became encroachment on the Amazon. In Paraguay, their forests have just been chopped down, chopped down. In parts of Argentina, also, um, areas of the Pampas um, plains being turned into soy, and then uh, even some forested areas also, forests being cut down so that soy can be grown. Currently, the World Wildlife Fund is working to support more environmentally friendly, sustainable policies with soy production. But it's an uphill battle as the demand continues to soar. So is soy inherently evil? Of course not. But like everything, moderation is paramount. And as you can see in any list of ingredients, our soy usage seems to be at an excess. And to the 1.9 million Americans with soy allergies, it makes grocery shopping and eating out more difficult. Leave a comment down below, hit that like button, and subscribe to our channel so you can be notified whenever we post new videos.